Hello, I'm Vic Johnson. You're watching the Goals to Go Show. This is a show about learning how to set your goals, and then we're going to give you the tools and techniques of the rich and famous so you can achieve them. Today's topic, the 10 biggest reasons why goals fail. And couldn't have anybody wiser, anybody that has more information to share with us today than an old friend of mine, Chris Widener. I met Chris on the Internet a number of years ago and then had the great pleasure a number of times now to meet him in person. Chris is a dynamic guy. Here's a guy who has been a pastor. He took and grew some uh, churches to become huge churches. He's been a speaker. He is a phenomenal and prolific author, and he's got a new book out. I hope he'll talk about The Twelve Pillars, a great book that he co-authored with our friend Jim Rohn. And we've got him here today. So, Chris, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great yeah. to be here. Chris, 10 biggest reasons why goals fail. I mean, it's a topic that, you know, we, we, we set out, we have good intentions, and life gets in the way, things get in the way. What are some of the reasons that goals fail? And, and what can we do uh, to overcome those? Well, I think the first one is have some. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so simple, especially I suppose we might be preaching to the choir a little bit here because if people are watching the goals to go, they're goal-oriented or they want to become goal-oriented. But I'm amazed at how many people just have no goals. I mean, if you think about it, walk up to somebody and say, hey, what are your goals for the new year? And most people will say, hmm, uh, hadn't really thought about it. Occasionally somebody might say, well, I want to stop smoking, but that was their goal last year and the year before and the year before. But I, I think really it's just very important to have some goals and write them down. And, you know, there's been all these studies about the difference between people who have goals and don't have goals. So that's a starter, right? The people who have goals succeed more than the people who don't. But then the people who write their goals down versus the people who might have goals, they've kind of formulated them in their mind, but they haven't ever written them down. The difference between those two is even more extraordinary because the fact that you write it down, somebody might say, well, is that magical? And I don't think it's magical. And there's nothing that happens in the universe that makes it work. But if you think about the, just the practical implications of writing writing it down, first of all, you remember more that you write down than if you just think it. And then secondly, what do you do with something that you write down? You keep it. You stick it up on the, on the, uh, the mirror so you can read it. And so by, the act of writing it down isn't magical in and of itself, but it continually reiterates it in our mind because we're rereading it. Right. We're going back and, and going at it. So I would say the first thing is just to have some goals. Right. And I'm assuming you got tons of goals. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, and, and interesting that, that our friend Brian Tracy says you got a thousand percent better chance to uh, achieve your goal if it's written down. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. Amazing. Chris, another reason that people fail is that they choose goals that aren't their own. Yeah, and, and that's true. You know, you think about every, I mean, there's so many parts of our, uh, of our lives where we try to earn the kind of income that our parents wanted us to have. Or, you know, women in our culture, there's this societal view of what women are supposed to look like. You know, everybody's got to be a size four. Or, you know, so many of these kinds of things that other people, whether it's individuals like our parents or our spouses are putting on us or our bosses are putting on us. But then you have these cultural goals, like what's the American dream? Well, what is the American dream? The American dream is something different for every single person, but we've got an idea of what the American dream, you know, 50 years ago it was the little white house, the little picket fence, and, and so culture's trying to tell us what our goals should be, individuals are trying to tell us what our goals should be, and the fact is, is that we should all set our own goals. And my favorite story about that is from my book, The Angel Inside, where Michelangelo's father, uh, he was sort of a waning business person, and he thought, okay, I gotta have Michelangelo go into business to restore the family name. And so his goal for Michelangelo was to open up a little shop in Florence and become successful business-wise and work up in the ranks and become friends with the powers that be. And Michelangelo said no. And he moved out of the house and he went to live with the de' Medici family who were patrons of the arts. Right. And, and he got a, a person who would help him learn how to do art better. And what's ironic is by following his own goal rather than his father's goal, he actually accomplished his father's goal of restoring the family name. Now everybody knows the, the name of Michelangelo and, and his family name now because he followed his own goal rather than somebody else's goal for him. And that was because it was born out of his own passion. Right. Another reason that uh, people don't reach their goals, they set a goal that's not worthwhile enough. And it's kind of along my uh, theme of no dream too big, but uh, talk to us a minute about setting goals that aren't worthwhile. 
Yeah, I love I, I love what you've done, and, and I actually, having listened to your talk about John Goddard, and I sat down and I wrote down the hundred things that I wanted to do, and the places I wanted to go, and the places I wanted to visit, and one of the beautiful things about that is that it's they're big. And I'll tell you a funny story, and this is kind of interesting because it, it revolves around something that you challenged me to do through your talk at the Jim Rohn event. Um, I re- sat down and wrote those down, and this was you know a year year and a half, two years ago, something like that. And one of them was. Uh, something I'm going to tell you in a minute. And then, so now I'm doing a show on T, uh, on uh, TSTN and doing this show. The first day that I was filming, I called my wife that night and I said, uh, hey, how's it going? You know, uh, followed up with how the day went. She said, well, it was kind of interesting. Hannah brought your dream journal in. And she walked in and she said, well, Dad can write off number 14 now. Well, number 14 is have my own television show. Is that right? And so it, it was amazing because at the time, you know, I wouldn't have ever figured out how I'd have a television show. Would have right. loved to have one. It was a big dream. Right. But uh, I wrote it down and I began to think about it and some opportunities presented themselves. Well, that's a pretty big dream to have your own television show. Sure. And, uh, and you know, a lot of people don't set these big dreams. And, and the problem with not setting a big dream or a big goal, uh, sometimes I use dreams and goals synonymously, is that they're not motivating. I mean, <clears throat> you know, if somebody says, uh, I'm going to lose one pound in the next nine months. Well, nobody's going to get on with you know get on board with that. But you have a big goal, or if I'm going to earn, somebody says I'm going to earn an extra hundred dollars this year. Well, you know you're never going to think about that. But if somebody says I'm going to earn an extra fifty thousand dollars, that's worthwhile. It's it's enough. It's big enough that it it enhances and, and elicits your passion to go after it and go get it and say, that's a big goal. I can go and achieve something like that. So I have you to thank for having my own well, television good. show <laughs> because I wrote it down Fantastic. And, and, it, and it happened. Well, along that lines, I mean, you you obviously had to have a list for that to happen. It had to be written down. And the, the, the funny thing is when you accomplished it, it took someone else to remind you that you'd written it down. Yeah. And it was my daughter, and that's that's actually a good point for us. Is is we can go and we should let other people know what our goals are. You know, the fact that my 14 year old daughter knew what my goal was was fantastic, because I keep a leather journal and inside of it, and all my kids have gone and they've read through it. They know the places I want to visit and the things I want to do, and and all that. My wife knows what they are, and and it not only it not only uh, gives me some accountability because people will say, hey, you know, have you accomplished that goal or when are you going to get to that goal? But it also helps people really be able to, uh, um, really helps people be able to see that it's a, a positive thing and it sets a good example. So, Fantastic. Chris, you know, a lot of people that come to me for consulting about goals, one of the biggest problems that I see is a lack of focus when it comes to achieving goals. Yeah, it really is interesting how um, some people are just not, they have no focus in life, right? They're, they're like what I call a paper cup in, a, in an empty parking lot with the wind blowing. You know, the wind goes this way and the paper cup rolls and, and then the wind blows this way and then it kind of goes that back that way. That gets back to that first one, have some goals. But then above and beyond that, making sure that we focus in on the goals. And that's part of the beauty of writing it down and, and continually reiterating them in our minds. Memorizing them is, a, is another good thing. Now, you might not be able to memorize 500 of them, but putting them in your mind and then constantly running them through your mind uh, puts that focus down in your mental aspect of it where you're constantly saying this is my goal this is my goal but then the other thing is is just taking action on them every single day if you have a goal of uh, of doing something in particular say writing a book um, I love the old thing uh, somebody asked Chuck Swindoll how'd you write your books and he says one page at a time you know <laughs> he just focused in on them. in fact I think it was Swindoll who said he only writes one hour a day he's written I think 40 or 50 books now and he says I write one hour a day I get up I focus in on it I write the the uh, book for an hour and then I'm done for the day. Right. And some people might say, well, why don't you focus more attention? He said, but if you do it regularly, at the end of the year, I have 365 hours of writing. And he right. does it seven days a week. Right. And that's focus, putting some mental energy in it, into it, putting some physical energy into it, and focusing down on it, not letting other things you know, draw our attention away. And there's a million and a half things that draw our attention away all the time, right. from the television to what people want us to do for them to charity, things that we're involved in. But we've got to take our goals and focus in on them a little bit every single day. Right. And that's focus. Part, and part of focus uh, is another reason why we fail is not having a vision. A clear vision. <clears throat> yeah. Describe to me, and I, I mean, you're you're a guy who's taken so many things. We were talking before the show about one of your goals. So many things that you've taken that that you know literally didn't exist. You created a vision. I remember 
the email I got from you when you moved into your house, your yeah. dream house. What yeah. a, I mean, and it was so unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, share that vision with us and share some, you know, just the, the, the failure to have a vision is such a big uh, reason why people don't reach goals. Yeah, and that's a good, the, the story of my house is actually a really good one because it also teaches a lesson of how long you might have to pursue a goal. Uh, the house that I live in now was built in 1983. Uh, so, at the time that we moved in, 21 years, because we moved in on October 6, 2004. So 21 years after it was built. It was built out near where I used to go to, uh, to high school. And in fact, the, the road that I now live on is where I totaled my first car, a 1968 Mustang. I totaled in, totaled in high school. Probably be worth like $75,000 now if I still had that car. But uh, So I used to drive this road a lot, and, uh, and I would drive by even up until five, four years ago. I would drive by the house, and it has a huge front gate. It's got these big brick pillars and wrought iron in between, and it's like 300 feet long, and big wrought iron gates that open up like this, you know, almost like Graceland without the music notes on it. And I would drive way, way you know, drive past it, slow way down, and I look off into the, and I look at the roof of the house, because all you can see is the roof. And for 21 years, I said, I'm going to buy that house someday. It was just weird. I knew that I was supposed to live in that house someday. Well, okay, so for a kid who grew up with nothing, uh, to look at that house and say, I'm going to live there someday, that in and of itself is a, is a big dream. But then the other thing is, is for 21 years. And when I wrote that article uh, that was built off the letter that I wrote to my friends and said, hey, we're moving into this house, I wrote an article about it, uh, about pursuing your dream for 21 years. I had so many people who wrote back to me and said, if you can pursue a dream for 21 years, it gives me the hope to pursue mine for another year or another two years. You know, so that's, it's an exciting thing to have a, a big vision. And, you know, somebody asked me the other day, what is vision? And what a visionary goal is, is it's something spectacular. You know, our lives are mundane for the most part. We get up, we relatively do the same things every day. We go to the same little coffee shop, at least I do, read the same newspaper, you know. Our lives are built around the mundane, but it's the spectacular that draws us along, you know, and, and gives us that meaning and that purpose and that passion to continue living our lives. That's what a big, uh, dreamy, visionary goal does for us. It says the reason I do this stuff every single day, the reason I go off to this uh, job every single day is because it's going to provide a financial future that's going to allow me to retire early and travel the world or, you know, whatever. Big dreams, big goals are, they're just absolutes. And right. I've seen them work in my own life. So. Right. And, and let's use that as an example for the next reason why goals fail. 21 years before you moved in, yeah. you saw that yeah. house, you got a vision, but your life at that point in time, there was nothing about it that would have said you'd ever live in that house. Yeah. So limiting beliefs, yeah. the, the belief that you can't do it, the belief that, you, that it won't happen, yeah. is another reason why goals fail. Yeah. So tell us then how we handle limiting beliefs and what we do to, to get the belief that, in our vision. Yeah. I had a real amazing thought come to me a few years ago. We were watching a television show. I don't remember what the name of it was, but it was one of these makeover shows, right, where they do plastic surgery and everything. And they were taking people who were not particularly attractive and they were making them very attractive. And again, don't remember what the name of the show was, but I do remember one thing about it. They had a staff psychologist. And I thought, that's bizarre. Well, I mean, if you go from being not particularly attractive to being very beautiful, why would you need a psychologist? I mean, I could see if you were a New York runway model making $10,000 an hour and you get in an accident and all of a sudden you're dis disfigured. I could see needing a psychologist, right? But it, it made me realize something that... Um, that these people were not able to see themselves. They had a belief about themselves that was not what they were then currently looking in the mirror in. And I started thinking about that. Okay, what about people who win a million dollars in the lottery and a year later they're broke? You know, what about people who lose a bunch of weight and a year later it's all back again? And it, it made me think through this whole process of what we believe to be true about ourselves actually molds us into living the kind of life that is based on the belief we have about ourselves. Right. And so we can set a goal. We say, okay, I want to make a million dollars. But if you don't believe that you're the type of person who can make a million dollars, you're never going to make a million dollars. In fact, when we moved into this house, uh, we, we pulled into this, uh, into this house, right? And the people who had moved us, they, they left our old house. They packed us up in our old house and they, they drove the big truck in. And the guy says to my wife, did you guys win the lottery? You know, and, and, and for the first couple of weeks, my wife and I would say, we feel like we're on vacation, like we're renting this house because we didn't feel like we belonged there. Right. It was so new to us. It stretched us so, so far because I was saying, 
do I deserve this? Is, is this is this me? Is right. this? And I think that a lot of times. Our goals, they should outpace who we believe we are. That's, that's important to draw us along. But then we need to work on that part about, am I the type of person who could make a million dollars? Am I the type of person who could lose that kind of weight? Am I the type of person who could have a relationship with that really neat person? Right. Um, and we got to work on that part of us. It's so important, that heart part of us. Right. And a lot of it is just telling ourselves, you know, telling ourselves repetitively, I am that type of person. I am a good person. I do deserve these kinds of things. I can change my life. And by changing our thoughts, we change our beliefs. And by changing our thoughts and beliefs, we change our actions. And when we change our actions along the lines of our goals, we change our lives. Right. It's, it's, it's really an amazing principle. It's a little esoteric, you know, when you start thinking about it. But it, it was something that really struck me was these people they can't carry out their long-term goals because they're limiting beliefs. Right. They don't think, I, I'm the type of person who can do that type right. of they thing. They don't feel worthy. Yeah. And sometimes it's just making a little bit of a, of a gain and then saying, oh, I feel comfortable at this level, right. you know, and then a little bit more of a gain. It's why a kid can't go from playing junior high football to NFL football. I imagine right. even though they're great, when they go to the high school, all of a sudden they're kind of going, wow, these are the high school kids. I right. know I'm good. but right. And then they play a few games and they score a couple touchdowns. They go, hey, now I'm the man at the high school level. Right. Then they go to the college level. And at every level you go up, you have to learn to feel comfortable with who you are and the belief that you belong. Right. Well, the word positive attitude is probably used a lot, and, and, and so much so that it may have been cheapened in some respects by, by its use so much. But uh, certainly a, a reason why goals fail is because of attitude. Yeah. Uh, what do you see? Is that something someone can do? They're out there uh, you know, going for their goals. Maybe they didn't have an upbringing that uh, supported them, encouraged them. Uh, and the attitude's in the way. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is just to say, I can. To, to come to that belief that says, I can. I know that I can. It may be hard. It may be difficult. It may be the hardest thing I've ever done. But I've seen other people do it, and so I can do it. I know that I can do it. And to, to take that attitude that says, at least I'm going to try. I'm going to attempt to change my life. I believe that it can happen because I've seen other people do it. But I'm I'm going to try because I know that I can do it if I try. My mom, you know, I've written eight books now, and I had two books that came out uh, recently, both co-authored with some some people who I, I love and enjoy and, and like uh, their work. Um, I can remember my mom taking me into bookstores when I was a kid and saying, see all these authors? If they can write a book, so can you. And she started instilling this idea that, hey, I can do something if I apply myself to it. And so the attitude of I can is very important. And, and ultimately, it's an optimistic attitude. It's the idea that says life can be better, my career can be better, my relationships can be better if I apply myself to it. And so, you know, um, just going out and saying to yourself, uh, I'm going to give it a shot. I don't know if I'm going to be able to accomplish it, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I like to think of the word optimism as it relates to its root word. If you take optimism, break it down, it's the word opt. And if you think about that, it has sort of two meanings that help me remember what optimism is. Optimism is, first of all, when you opt to do something. You run email lists, right? right. And you have opt-in email lists. People are choosing to get your emails every week. So part of optimism is this idea of choice. We opt to do it. Then my father-in-law and my sister-in-law, they are both ophthalmologists. O-P-T is the beginning of that word. Well, what do ophthalmologists work on? They work on your eyes, on how you see. So the way I always remember what optimism is, is it's choosing to see the world in a better way. Now, being an optimist, people say, oh, you're just pie in the sky. Well, no, optimists are also realists. Realists are people who say, this is the way it is. But what separates an optimist from a pessimist is an op a pessimist says this is the way it is and it's probably going to get worse. An optimist says this is the way it is, but I think we can make it better. Right. And so this idea of viewing the world in the way it can be is what then changes us and moves us along. And leaders uh, makes you a better leader if you're an optimist because people, you know, people want to follow somebody who has a better vision of the future. You know, they've done studies and they've found that in the last 15 presidential elections, 14 of them were won by the person who spoke in their speeches most optimistically. Right. Yeah, it, it, win, it's, it wins elections. Right. You know, and you've got a political background, you know that too, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, you've worked with lots of politicians. You speak optimistically and you set that goal for yourself and for others, right. and it's dynamic. It, it pulls you along, it attracts you along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've, you know, I've worked on my attitude. I've got a clear vision. 
and then perhaps the biggest reason goals fail. My friend David Herlinger says it's the biggest country in the world, procrastination. <laughs> I've never heard that before, <laughs> procrastination. Yeah, it's really true. And I'd li really like to talk about that, but we'll have to get that next time. <laughs> uh, no, procrastination, I mean, it, and, and we all do it. I mean, it's human nature, right? In fact, I was interviewing Jim Rohn the other day, and he says, you know, I've written, I can't remember what it was, eight books or something like that. And he said, I should have written 28 books. But, you know, it's, it's human nature. Even the people who want to do the best, the people who succeed the most, who we look at and say, oh, they've achieved this, 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 and this. If you sat them down and said, is there anything you've been putting off? Every single person would say, yeah, well, I've been meaning to do this, quit that, or start that, or, or whatever. It's probably one of the reasons why New Year's resolutions work, is because there's sort of a outside of ourselves, tangible line in the sand that says, okay, now I can get started, right? You know, well, it's, it's July, I know I need to lose a little weight, I'll just wait till the New Year, because i, I got to eat through the holidays, or whatever. We have this uh, incredible capacity to rationalize. I do, you do, the best of us do. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really unfortunate is that the masses do it too much. And, uh, and the ability to succeed is to procrastinate less. Right. I don't think that the ability to, su to succeed at a goal is to never procrastinate because I think human nature is such that we, we all want to put off what's hard. Right. You know, It's why Jim Rohn can say you're going to experience one of two pains right. in your life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Right. Well, nobody likes the discipline part. Nobody likes skipping the, the chocolate fudge at Christmas time. You know, nobody likes to uh, stop doing the things that they like to do. And right. So it's, it's a powerful force, but the way you get over procrastination is taking action immediately. Right. Every single day, if you're watching this show and it's July, take action. If you're watching this show, it's November, take action. Start tomorrow in a small, simple way and start hammering away at it, and that's the way you, you beat getting away from getting your goals. If you want to make your goals, you've got to start taking action immediately. Chris, I've uh, cured procrastination. I've taken some action, at least for the moment, and I begin working on my goal. Another big reason people fail, they quit too soon. Yeah. We were talking the other day, a friend of mine and I, about a college football recruiter who recruited one of the best quarterbacks in college football history. And he went down to visit this guy, and he was living in this town, living with his mother. And the mother, the college was, you know, like eight or ten hours away. And the mom really wanted this young man to go to school near her. Well, this recruiter had this goal to, to uh, get this kid to come. He really felt like he could do something for the kid, really help him out, give him a great opportunity. Uh, the schools around him were much smaller. So this recruiter went back and back and back and back, and he said, that's my goal is to get this kid because it would be good for me, but it would really be good for the kid too. Well, he finally got this kid and the mom to say, okay, the mom said, I will entrust him to you. Well, they ended up winning a national championship. That kid scored the running. Uh, he ran the ball in for the national championship and scored the winning touchdown and, and has just a tremendous career ahead of him. And, and this friend of mine were saying, what if he would have quit? What if he wouldn't have went down that last time to ask that kid to come to his college again? And, and we just started thinking about how many things never happen because you quit. And somebody might say, well, but if I keep doing it, it might not, never, you know, might not ever happen. Yeah, but if you quit, I can guarantee it's never going to happen. Isn't it better to continue to try? Because, you know what, you, you think about, well, you've interviewed Mark Victor Hansen. I think he was rejected 140 times for Chicken Soup for the it Soul. It was a lot. What if, what, I mean, how would the landscape of personal professional development, the book industry, have changed if there would have never been a Chicken Soup for the Soul? Right. If at the 90th rejection letter, Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield would have said, nobody's ever going to buy this book. Right. Let's just go, I'm going to go be an accountant, you go be a CPA, or, you know, or whatever, and let's go our separate ways. You know, think about that. 110 million books sold. Right. One of, one of the biggest uh, parts of uh, the failure to persist is discouragement. Yeah. When the season of discouragement comes, how do you fight discouragement? I mean, you've, you've certainly hadn't been an easy path for you, an easy road for you. There's yeah. been times I know that you, you know, hit the wall. Yeah. How do you fight discouragement? Friends. It, truly, just friends. Um, I go to lunch with my, I'm very proactive at, at 
achieving friendships, developing friendships. I go to lunch regularly with my friends. We have nitty-gritty conversations about what's going on in our lives, business lives, personal lives, and we talk about them. And we encourage each other. And we give each other advice. And sometimes it's not easy, you know, when your friend says, hey, well, here's the reason, bozo. You know, you're messing up and you, you don't want to hear it. But when you listen to it from a friend, there's an old proverb that says wounds from a friend can be trusted. Yeah. And when I have a friend who looks me in the eye and says, well, here's the reason it's not happening for you, you can trust that because you know that they have their best interest, your best interest at heart. You know that they love you. That they, you know that they're speaking truthfully to you. So I really, I, I mean, I fight discouragement by developing friendships and having the kinds of relationships that I need. Every single year, it's on the calendar, uh, one of my best friends and I, we go out to a fancy lunch. It's usually a steak lunch at the very end of the year, and it's our, it's our Christmas lunch. And what we do is we ask, how did the year go? And what do you have planned for the next year? And it's one of the most meaningful uh, meals that I eat all year round. We look forward to it every single year. I particularly look forward to it next year because it's his turn to pay. We alternate turn times paying, right? And uh, I just do it with friends. Get some friends around you, people who love you, people who care for you. Tell them what your goals are. Tell them what your dreams are. And then meet with them and let them encourage you. You know, when you get down and say, ah, it's just not working for me, they'll say, hey, it's going to work for you. Keep on plugging away. And when you hear those positive words, then you it, it spurs you on. It lifts you up. gives you the passion to do it. Well, I know that uh, one of the the biggest reasons that uh, we also don't reach our goals is failure to measure our progress. Yeah. And I know in all the projects you've done, I want you to tell us about uh, your new book, 12 Pillars, and tell us how you go through the process of writing a book and here in the, as we close up here and, and how that all uh, ties into measuring our progress as we go along with a goal. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different ways to write a book. Some people write it uh, one page at a time. I think we mentioned that with uh, Chuck Swindoll. But um, my process is a little bit different. I tend to let it all formulate in my brain for months and months and months, and I might jot down some notes about it, and then I sit down and just go right out. I might put down a, a, an outline at the very beginning of the Word document, and then I just let it all go. I just, I just wrote another book, which will come out in the uh, middle of next year, and I wrote it in one week, I, but it was all up here. I wrote it over nine months, but then I wrote it on paper over the course of Monday morning to Friday afternoon. And so, um, you know, that's just the process of, of getting it out is differently. But I did measure, you know, those results. you got to go back and always say, what am I doing? How far am I along the process? And then it gives you those little markers that you continue to move forward. Fantastic. Yeah. I know your website is madeforsuccess.com. Madeforsuccess.com and chriswidener.com. Madeforsuccess.com and chriswidener.com. You've got a lot of resources there, especially in the leadership area. Yeah. You're probably the rising star in America today in terms of training leaders. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and uh, I've enjoyed having you here today. Is there anything uh, that you've uh, especially found helpful as you start out on a goal process to, to overcome failure? Uh, I tell people about it because once you're on the mark and you tell people, hey, uh, I'm doing this, they'll ask you. They come back and say, hey, how's that going? And if you, you last thing you want to say is, well, I, did, didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> so you want to say, <laughs> I'm going along, and they go, perfect. So tell people. Chris, thanks for, having, for joining us today. We enjoyed having you. Next time, we're going to be talking about becoming the person you need to be with Jim Rohn. So now that you've got goals, it's time to go. We'll see you next time.